All right, last week we finished studying Jesus' final words of teaching and exhortation before His suffering and death, which we normally refer to as the Passion. So when I'm talking about the Passion, I'm talking about the entire set of events that include you know, everything that takes place up to the cross. Now, let's review just a little bit uh, what He has done so far. Uh, in His teaching and His prayer with the apostles so far, He has promised to send the Holy Spirit to comfort and empower them uh, during His uh, absence. He also prays that God will go through with the plan to save mankind through His death and that this action will glorify both the Father and the Son. We talked about that last week. And also He expresses His love for the apostles because of their faith. And he prays that God will protect and enable them to do the mission that they have been entrusted with. And then finally, this is in that very long prayer here that we talked about last time. Uh, he prays that the love and unity between themselves, which is based on God's word, will extend to the apostles and all future disciples because of that same word. And so uh, once he has completed the prayer, Jesus is going to go across the valley to uh, pray alone in the Garden of Gethsemane, and that's where we begin our lesson today. So let's go to chapter 18, if you're reading along in your Bibles, and read verse one and two. It says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the ravine of Kidron, where there was a garden in which he entered with his disciples. Now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place, for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So having ended the supper, the group leaves the safety of the upper room. Uh, it would be normal for Jesus to leave the city and cross the valley of Kidron, not a very deep valley, about a, about a mile and a half from the top to the bottom back to the top on the other side. And on the other side of the valley was the road to Bethany. Uh, and of course we know that Bethany is where Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived and where Jesus normally stayed when He went to Jerusalem. You know, he'd be, his home was in the north, right? In Capernaum, that's where He lived actually. And He would come from time to time to Jerusalem. Well, He didn't have a quote, an apartment or anything in Jerusalem. He would stay with uh, Lazarus and Mary and Martha because He was only a few miles from Jerusalem. Now when you take that road, if you leave the city of Jerusalem, go down the valley, take the road, the Garden of Gethsemane is immediately on your right. Uh, it was a place where there were olive trees and a lot of travelers stopped to rest there before pushing on to Jerusalem. So they'd, they'd make the long trip and before the last push, you know, down the valley up into the city, they would stop. Uh, it was a traveler's stop at the same time, place where people could sit and rest. So far, it would be normal for the Lord and the apostles to stop and rest at this halfway point between Jerusalem and Bethany. Perhaps this is why Judas knew where to find Jesus, because it was a spot that he normally frequented. So let's keep reading verse three. He says, Judas then, having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am he. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. So when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Therefore he again asked them, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am He. So if you seek Me, let these go their way, to fulfill the word which He spoke of, uh, of those whom you, uh, you have given Me, I lost not one. Note that John uh, doesn't give any details concerning Jesus' prayers and, and dialogue with the apostles in the garden. And these are all well covered in Matthew and Mark and, uh, and Luke. John describes the simplest of terms, Jesus' betrayal and His arrest. So Judas was accompanied by a mix of Roman soldiers and temple security guards, and he went to the garden knowing that Jesus would be, would be there. 
They had lanterns to search the area, obviously, because there was no light in that place. Note that Jesus is the one who steps forward and He finds them and He takes them by surprise, asking them to name you know, who they're looking for. And they're so startled that in backing away, they trip and fall over each other. I mean, it's like a little detail. You, know, you had to be there to, to kind of catch that little, that little detail. Note also that even in this episode, Jesus is asking them to confess who they believe Him to be. Who are you looking for? And did you notice what they answered? They said, Jesus the Nazarene, which is purely His human name. Jesus, the man from the city of Nazareth. Not even the respect as a teacher or a prophet, certainly not the Lord or the Messiah. They didn't even give him the respect of saying, we're looking for the rabbi, we're looking for the teacher. You know, nothing, we're just looking for that Jesus who comes from, from Nazareth. So Jesus repeats that he is the man they seek and demands that they let the apostles go, not just for safety's sake, but also to fulfill what he himself had promised them in the past. You know, during his ministry, Jesus promised that none except Judas would be lost among his apostles. He said that in John chapter 6, 19, also repeated it in chapter 17. That they escape now is fulfillment of that promise. So let's look at uh, verse 10 and 11. Simon Peter then, having a sword, uh, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear and the slave's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put up the sword into the, sheet, uh, into the sheath, rather, the cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? And so Peter, you know, showing his misunderstanding of the moment, you know, he really didn't get it yet, is ready to fight. He's ready to start the revolution, to usher in the new kingdom, the new order of things. If, if fighting is what we need, let's fight. Jesus commands him to stop, and in a reference to his prayer in the garden about the cup of suffering he has agreed to take, Jesus you know, reaffirms his willingness to go to the cross because, well, because that's the Father's will. We're not going to fight these people. The Father wants me to go to the cross, I'm going to go to the cross. Oh yes, there's going to be a revolution, all right. There's going to be a great change that comes, but it'll be accomplished by his death and his resurrection, not through civil war. So John doesn't mention it, but in Luke chapter 22, 51, Luke says that Jesus touched the man's ear and healed him. All right, so now we go to the episodes where Jesus is before the priests. There were three sessions before the high priests, uh, but John only reports one of those sessions, all right? Uh, here's the order of, it's a little confusing, you know, but here's the order of what took place. First of all, there's the session before Annas, who was the former high priest and the father-in-law of the present high priest Caiaphas. And John describes this one. Annas had retired, but as in many situations with leaders, he kept the title and he kept the influence long after he was not officially in power. Well, we do the same things, don't we? We still call uh, uh, Mr. Bush president. He's introduced as president. He's no longer the president, but he has the honorary title. Same thing. The high priest, once you were high priest, if you resigned or you know, if you, you retired or whatever, you still kept the title, even though another high priest had taken your place. Then uh, um, Anna sent Jesus to his son-in-law, Caiaphas, who was the official high priest that year. And along with the other leaders of the Sanhedrin, they questioned Jesus late into the night. Then Caiaphas convened another early morning meeting at which Jesus was condemned. And then Jesus was taken to Pilate, who at first sent him to Herod, and then later questioned and sent him to his death on the cross. So in, the, in his gospel, John only describes the session with Annas and Pilate with a brief mention of Caiaphas, but that's the order of you know, how Jesus was kind of bandied about from place to place. So let's read verse 12 to 14. So the Roman cohort and the commander and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him and led him to Annas first, for he was father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. 
Now Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was expedient for one man to die on behalf of the people. So between the lines here, are made, we're made to understand that Annas has been charged with making a, a preliminary examination, probably to establish the charges that will be brought against Jesus. John mentions Caiaphas' statement to show that the, end, uh, that the end of this trial was a foregone conclusion. They knew what they wanted to do, they just had to kind of you know, get the charges and go through the motions, so to speak. Verses 15 to 18, Simon Peter was following Jesus and so was another disciple. Now that, now that disciple was known to the high priest and entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter was standing at the door outside. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. Then the slave girl who kept the door said to Peter, you're not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. Now the slave and the officers were standing there, having made a charcoal fire, for it was cold and they were warming themselves, and Peter was also with them, standing and warming himself. So John kind of shifts the scene to the courtyard, where he reveals that Peter and another disciple had followed from a distance. John is probably referring to himself here in the third person, and he's done this before when he refers to himself in his own gospel. So these events are taking place in the spring and it would have been cold in the middle of the night. John records one of the three denials he will make concerning Jesus. Again, the cycle, remember the cycle. Here Peter is challenged to declare, what, do you believe or don't you believe? And he, he fails the test at this point. So let's look at verse, um, uh, verse 19. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews came together and I spoke nothing in secret. Why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the officers standing nearby struck Jesus saying, is that the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, if I have spoken wrongly, testify of the wrong, but if rightly, why do you strike me? So Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So Annas, with the title high priest, is searching for some kind of charge so that Caiaphas can have something to work with when the Sanhedrin is convened. The Sanhedrin was made up of 70 <laughs> elders, if you wish, who ruled um, with the permission of Rome. So they were like a council, you know, a ruling council. Um, interesting thing is that this questioning and a meeting of the leaders as night was actually against the law, but they went ahead with it anyways. So they, they convened unlawfully to bring up this charge. Jesus responds truthfully that what He has taught had been done so openly and anyone who has heard it can give Him the information He wants. In other words, they had no right and they had no need to bring him bound to an illegal questioning because of anything they needed to know, because they already knew what he taught. It was just common knowledge. It was out there. So this accusation makes Annas look foolish. And in order to protect him, one of the guards strikes Jesus with his hand to just shut him up. I mean, the worst of all, it's the worst insult to anybody, but to the Jew, that was the worst of all insult, to be struck with the open hand. I want you to note also that Jesus doesn't challenge, or the, the guard doesn't challenge what Jesus said. He only defends the position and the honor of Annas. Also, this was highly irregular that a guard would strike a bound prisoner while he was making a defense. Even in our courtroom today, can you imagine somebody in the witness stand you know, being questioned by the prosecutor uh, about a certain thing and he says, well, uh, you know, I, I left the restaurant at nine o'clock, you know, it couldn't have been me. And the prosecutor smacks him in the face. No, you're lying. You know? I mean, it's pretty much what happened here. So Jesus doesn't re uh, re uh, retaliate. He merely forces his attacker to consider his motive for striking him. Seeing that their questioning was not getting them anywhere, Annas and those with him decide to send Jesus on to Caiaphas for
for the official questioning. So let's keep reading, verse 25. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, so they said to him, you're not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off, said, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied it again, and immediately a rooster crowed. So it's interesting, you know, just as a play, you know, it's two, two, two different scenes. He keeps switching from the courtyard to the courtroom, if you wish, back and forth, back and forth. This time he goes back to pick up the scene in the courtyard with Peter. John records two more denials where Peter's accusers are circling closer and closer to his true identity. Now with the cock crowing, we also have another fulfillment of Jesus' word about Peter, as well as an indication of what time it is. You know, we're really getting into early dawn. So Peter had been the first to openly claim his faith in Jesus as the Christ. He was the first one, remember? And now he is one of the first ones to deny Christ openly when the threat of persecution is at hand. You know, he, he's, he's covered a lot of ground here, Peter has. All right, so now the scene switches again. Jesus goes before Pilate. John doesn't describe any of the details of the trials before Caiaphas and the leaders, this having been done by the other evangelists. You know, Matthew has kind of described that scene and so has Mark and Luke. As I said, trials at night were illegal at that time for the Jews now. It was illegal for Jews to do it. Now, it, it wasn't that the Romans imposed this on It was illegal according to Jewish law to have a trial at night. And the death sentence could not be pronounced on the same day as the trial. There had to be at least one day. You had the trial, there had to be a 24 hour period, and then you know, the, the, the sentence was pr pronounced. A kind of a, a time of reflection, make sure, you know, emotions calm down and so on and so forth. There's wisdom in that. So these leaders, they got around this by having an early morning session in addition to the late night one in order to officially pronounce the death penalty. We had two sessions. We had one last night, you know, <laughs> one minute before midnight. And then we had this, you know, a day goes by, we're the next day. You know what I'm saying? So since the Jews were not allowed to carry out a death sentence under Roman law, they, had, they didn't have the legal right to do that, they brought Jesus to the Roman governor in order to convince him to execute Jesus. Now, Roman courts were open from dawn to sunset, and so in the early morning, maybe 7 or 8 a.m., the Jews, uh, uh, Jesus rather, was brought to Pilate. So let's take a look at this scene. They led Jesus from Caiaphas into the Praetorium, and it was early and they themselves did not enter into the praetorium so that they would not be defiled but might eat uh, the Passover. Therefore Pilate went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, if this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. So Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews said to him, we are not permitted to put anyone to death to fulfill the word of Jesus which he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he was about to die. So the Jewish leaders, the guards, the followers, and Jesus stand outside the governor's quarters, not entering a, quote, Gentile abode for fear of defilement. In other words, they would be ceremoniously unclean and thus unable to participate in some of the remaining Passover activities. I want you to stop for a moment and recognize the hypocrisy going on here. I mean, um, they broke the law to condemn to death an innocent man who was their Messiah, but they refused to break the ceremonial law which would allow them to eat different foods during the Passover celebration. I mean, talk about not seeing it. Talk about blind. So, uh, uh, Roman laws and trials required an accuser and the accused to face each other before a Roman judge to argue over the validity of a charge. So whoever was accused was on one side, whoever was doing the accusation was on the other side, and they, deba they debated. And the Roman judge would decide between the two of them. Pilate, as governor, 
serves also as judge and he starts the proceedings with a request, what's the charge? Now the Jews know that there's no way a Roman judge would consider a case based on Jewish religion. So they make a kind of a generic charge against Jesus. They say, well, he's an evildoer. He's not a good guy. That's the charge. So Pilate, refusing to be manipulated, tells them to, you know what, if he's not a good guy, according to your laws, judge him yourself. Why are you here? Then the Jews come out with their true intention. They're looking for the death penalty, something only a Roman judge can grant. Notice they haven't brought a charge yet. They've only brought the penalty. Look, this guy's a bad guy, we want to we kill him. And we're not allowed, so we're bringing him to you. So John inserts here a little editorial comment, reinforcing the fact that even if Jesus is bound and silent at this point, he has already spoken about this event and he has already foretold of its happening. He's already said in advance, they're going to tie me, bound me, they're going to charge me, they're going to torture me, and they're going to kill me. He, and, and of course, I will raise from the dead. But he's already called it in advance. So in other words, Jesus controls even this situation because he called it in advance. All right, 33. He says, um, therefore, uh, Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, are you saying this on your own initiative or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus uh, answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore Pilate said to him, so you're a king. Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? So once Pilate hears of their request for the death penalty, he takes custody of Jesus and he brings him into the praetorium, which is a courtyard. Right? Uh, it's inside the gov government complex of buildings. I've actually been to that place where the praetorium, there's still a, a low wall that, that remains there, very interesting. So he officially begins the trial with the questioning of Jesus. Pilate begins with the accusation that could potentially carry the death penalty. You know, to declare oneself a leader or a king without Roman approval, you know, they didn't like that. They didn't like somebody saying, I'm a king or I'm in charge without their permission. So Pilate, um, uh, Pilate is insulted, replying that he's the governor and he's the judge. He's not a Jew. He's not personally involved you know, in the matter. But he sees that the Jews are out to kill Jesus and he wants to know, you know what, what are they so worked up about? What's the problem here? So the cycle continues as Jesus, this time before the pagan Roman official, proclaims his true nature and position as not being part of this, you know, this physical world. He's very logical. If he were a king of this world, there would be fighting and there would be civil war which the Jews accuse him of stirring up to gain favor. You know, the, the, the Jews are saying, this guy says he's the king, he's wanting to stir up a civil war, he's, tra he's a troublemaker. And so Jesus is saying, yeah, I am a king, but not of this world. If I was of this world, there'd be a war, but I'm not of this world. Now Jesus knows that Pilate has not had any such reports about him. The Lord acknowledges that uh, the part of the accusation which is true, he is a king, and he corrects the part which is not true. He is not a secular king, he's not a worldly king. So Pilate, you know, he understands this, but now he's curious. And he asks the Lord to explain more about the type of king that he is. Now Pilate probably expected Jesus to deny the charge, but when he doesn't, Pilate now, he wants clarification. You know, this guy's not just some random criminal. 
He's not a political rabble rouser because if he was, I would have heard about this guy. You know? he, he hasn't caused any civil disobedience or strife, yet he says he's a king. He's, he stands there quietly while they, while they accuse him. He's, he's that far away from being executed and yet he's composed, he's calm. Makes him curious. So Jesus proclaims more fully and in a way would engage and challenge this pagan, king, uh, this pagan governor before him. You know, think about it now. I mean, if I were in that situation, I, all I'd want to do is save my skin. <laughs> you know? But Jesus is always you know, thinking, okay, I have another individual in front of me who has an opportunity of really knowing who I am. The cycle of belief and disbelief the presentation, you know, how Jesus presents Himself, sometimes through miracles, some, sometimes through teaching, sometimes through the sheer force of His personality, reaching out to people saying, you know, there's just something different about this man. Who is he? And, and, and that's what Pilate is, is, the wheels are turning. Who is this guy? And Jesus you know, goes along with it. So He makes a confession of His true person. I mean, he said to Pilate that he's a divine king that has come to the world to bring truth. Now, he wouldn't have said anything to Pilate had Pilate said, uh, you want him killed? All right, guards, take him away. But he didn't. You know, his curiosity was piqued. So he said, okay, you Jews wait out here. I'll take him myself. I'll bring him in myself. So he brings him. There's just him and Pilate. Two men talking. And just like Nicodemus, you know, Nicodemus was a leader of the Jews, he had his questions. Jesus, it was just Jesus and Nicodemus. The more Nicodemus asked, the more Jesus gave him. Another question brought another answer and a, and a challenge to come a little further, come a little closer, come a little closer. Same thing's happening with Pilate. Who are you? I'm a king. Well, you know, uh, you know, I haven't heard about you. Well, I'm not a king of this place. Or don't you want me to let you go? Don't you know I have the power to set you free? Yes, I know that, but you know, if I were a king of this place, it'd be a war. There is no war. I'm a king from another place. So you know, little by little, Jesus is drawing him in. So now Jesus you know, extends to Pilate an invitation to pursue this truth. A truth that every person who seeks the truth will pursue. So the question left open to Pilate is, are you a truth seeker? I've come into this world to bring the truth. See the open-ended question? See how he kind of is drawing Pilate in? The unasked question that just hangs in the air is, are you a truth seeker? Now Pilate's response is so sad because it's missing one little word that would have made all the difference. If he would have said, what is the truth? Right, back and forth, right? Back and forth, back and forth. So Jesus comes back at him. You know, I came to bring the truth. He was just a step away. Well, what is this truth that you're bringing? Don't you think Jesus would have come back at him some more? So Pilate's response, as I said, is so sad because it's missing one little word that would have made all the difference. If he would have said, what is the truth? This would have opened the door of his heart to let Jesus plant the seed of the kingdom. But instead he answered, what is truth? Big difference. Which recognized what Jesus was saying, but refused to engage in a discussion about it. His point was like most educated Romans at the time. His mindset was skeptical, suspicious, and self-serving. The best truth was that which provided opportunity for self, if you were a Roman. 
In other words, in, in, in his mind, in his Roman mind, Pilate was thinking, everybody has a truth. Can this really be the truth? The guy, this guy who, he's standing in front of me, he's bound, he's helpless, he's about to get killed. This guy has the truth? I'm going to ask this guy if he knows the truth? So Pilate answers basically, you know what, everybody's got a truth. Can there really be one truth? Isn't that familiar? Isn't that what, in our world today, isn't that what we're thinking? There's no objective truth. Everything is relative. It's, there's your truth and my truth. And so long as my truth doesn't hurt you, it's good. So you know, a lot of times you hear speeches, sermons, so on and so forth, that talk about the new relativism. But relativism isn't that new. You know, it's, it's an old idea. Which truth have you got? Is it any better than my truth? OK, so we'll stop there. And next time when we get together, we're going to continue Jesus' public Roman trial before Pilate. We hit another big section there. We're going to stop right there for this time. We'll pick it up next time. All right.